All right, so ready to dive in. Today we're tackling a big one, a real theological head scratcher. We're talking about universalism. Yeah, universalism, the idea that everybody, and I mean everybody, eventually finds their way to salvation. Right, like that pearly gate swing wide open for everyone no matter what. Uh -huh. We've got a listener who's particularly curious about this whole idea, especially in light of, well, you know, Jesus and what he taught about salvation. Yeah, and to really get into it, we're digging into this piece from thickshades.com. And let me tell you, they do not mince words. They come right out and call universalism an illusion. An illusion, huh? So like <laughs> a mirage in the desert, something that seems real but isn't. I guess the big question is why? Where are they even coming from with this? Well, they go straight to what they see as the source, the ultimate authority, the Bible. And they point to a very specific verse, John 14, 6, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Right, that's a pretty well-known one. And they're basically saying, look, right here, Jesus himself is saying there's only one way to the Father, and it's through him. So that kind of throws a wrench in the whole everybody gets saved idea, right? I mean, yeah, that's one way to interpret it. But I've also heard people say that verse isn't necessarily about a literal physical path, you know, like maybe it's more about embodying the truths that Jesus represented. Oh, absolutely. And that's where things get really interesting, because throughout history, even within Christianity, there have been so many different interpretations of that verse and of salvation in general. Some scholars, for instance, they talk about inclusivism. Inclusivism. Basically the idea that maybe, just maybe, Christ's sacrifice covers those who lived good lives, even if they didn't explicitly know him, you know, as the Messiah. Mm -hmm. So it really all comes down to how you interpret the Bible, what you choose to emphasize. Is it strong? strict adherence to the letter of the law, or is it more about the spirit of the message? Right. So we're already seeing how much nuance there is to this whole thing. It's not exactly a simple yes or no answer. Yeah. But this source, they don't stop at John 14.6, do they? They also bring up Matthew 25.46, that whole imagery of the sheep and the goats, the eternal reward versus eternal punishment. Exactly. And that's a powerful image. Right. And they use it to reinforce this idea of a judgment day, a final reckoning, where there are very real and very permanent consequences for our actions. So how does that square with universalism? Well, to them, it doesn't. They see it as a direct contradiction. Because if everyone's ultimately saved, then what's the point of judgment? What are the stakes? They argue that if there's no real possibility of separation from God, then the whole idea of faith, of our choices having weight, it kind of loses its meaning. I see what you mean. It's like, if you know you're getting a passing grade no matter what, then why bother studying? Why bother putting in the effort? Exactly. But then that kind of makes God seem kind of harsh, doesn't it? Like if he really is all loving, wouldn't he want everyone to be saved? Yeah. Regardless of their actions? Ah, and there you've hit on one of the biggest theological conundrums of all time. If God is all loving, how can he allow suffering? And if everyone's ultimately redeemed, does that diminish the significance of Christ's sacrifice. I mean, these are questions that have been debated for centuries. Yeah, no easy answers there. But, you know, the source, they also suggest that this whole universalism idea might not just be theologically problematic. It might actually be, well, kind of dangerous. They call it a false sense of security, which I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound particularly good. Yeah. OK, so this false sense of security thing. Yeah. Let's unpack that a little. It sounds a bit ominous. Like, what are they getting at there? Well, I think what they're suggesting is that if you go through life truly believing that no matter what you do, no matter what choices you make, you're still guaranteed a spot in paradise. Well, that might take away some of the incentive to, you know, to really seek God, to wrestle with your faith, to even try to be a better person. It's like, why bother being good? Why bother with all the spiritual striving if it doesn't actually make a difference in the end? Exactly. And that actually ties into another important point they raise, which is the whole idea of free will. Because if we really do have the freedom to choose or reject a relationship with God, then shouldn't that choice have some kind of lasting impact? Right. Like our actions should have some kind of consequence. And they argue that universalism kind of undermines that. It takes away the weight of our choices. If everyone's saved anyway, then does it really matter what we do in this life? And that brings up a whole other set of questions about God's justice, about his mercy. Yeah, it gets back to that age old question, right? If God is all loving, how can he also be a God of justice? How do those two ideas coexist? And if we take universalism to its logical conclusion, does it diminish the sacrifice of Christ? 
those are some heavy theological concepts for sure. And I think what I appreciate about the source is that they're not afraid to dive right into those tough questions to point out some of the potential pitfalls of the universalist viewpoint. Right. Like they're saying, hey, let's follow this line of thinking all the way through and see where it leads. Exactly. Like, for example, they ask, if everyone's automatically redeemed, then what does that say about Christ's sacrifice? Does it make it less meaningful? Does it even make sense to talk about needing a savior if there's no real risk of eternal separation from God? Right. It's almost like it undermines the whole point of Christianity as it's been traditionally understood. And this is where critics of universalism, they often circle back to the importance of evangelism, of personal transformation. Because if you truly believe that your choices have eternal weight, then it makes sense that you'd want to share that message with others to help them find salvation and to try to live a life that reflects that belief. Okay, so we've covered a lot of ground here about why this source sees universalism as an illusion. And they make some pretty strong arguments, I have to say. Yeah. But there's still this idea that God desires everyone to be saved, right? We talked about that verse from Second Peter earlier. So how does that fit into all of this? Yeah, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? And honestly, it's one that has probably caused more theological debate than just about any other. How do you reconcile the idea of a loving God who wants everyone to be saved with this idea of judgment, of potential eternal consequences? That's the real head scratcher, yeah. How do you square those two things? It's like this theological paradox. And, you know, maybe there isn't a neat and tidy answer. Maybe it's one of those mysteries of faith that we just have to sit with, wrestle with. Even the source, as firm as they are in their stance against universalism, they acknowledge that it comes from this very human, very understandable desire to believe in a happy ending for everyone. Right, like nobody wants to imagine anyone facing eternal punishment. Exactly. And in their conclusion, they even quote this line. It's kind of poetic, actually, they say. The comfort sought in empty dreams is but a veil that softly gleams. The truth stands firm, unshaken still. His will is life, but not all will. Wow, that's, um, yeah, that's powerful. So they're saying don't give up on hope, but also don't mistake wishful thinking for reality. I think that's a good way to put it. Don't be afraid to ask the hard questions, to grapple with the complexity of faith. Because even if we don't have all the answers, the very act of searching, of wrestling with these ideas, it can be incredibly enriching, you know? It can challenge us to examine our own beliefs, to dig deeper into scripture, to really seek a more profound understanding of God's love and his justice. It's like they say, smooth seas don't make for very experienced sailors. Sometimes you need to weather a few theological storms to really grow your faith. I like that. Yeah, sometimes those storms are what make us stronger. But I also know for someone who really resonates with the idea of universalism, this might all feel kind of, well, disheartening. Yeah, I can see that. And it's important to remember, right, that within Christianity, there is room for a diversity of thought, a diversity of interpretation. The beauty of faith is that it's a journey, a personal journey. This particular source, they present a very specific case against universalism. But that doesn't invalidate the very real, very sincere seeking that leads other people to embrace it. So where does that leave us? If universalism isn't the answer, how do we as people of faith, how do we reconcile this idea of a loving God with this concept of eternal punishment? I mean, is that even possible? That's the million dollar question. And honestly, I don't know if there's one single satisfying answer, but maybe that's OK. Maybe it's not about solving the theological puzzle, you know, yeah. maybe it's more about how we live with the mystery. So it's less about having all the answers and more about, I don't know, how we walk the path, even with the uncertainty. I think that's a beautiful way to put it. How do we live lives of compassion, of love, of service, even when we don't have all the answers? How do we strive to embody the teachings of Christ, whether or not we believe in ultimate universal salvation? It's like we've shifted from debating the destination to really focusing on, like you said, how we navigate the journey itself. That feels like a really powerful takeaway. And I hope that's something our listeners will continue to reflect on long after this deep dive is over. Absolutely. So to everyone out there wrestling with these big questions, please don't stop seeking. Don't stop exploring. Keep those conversations going. And hey, if you happen to stumble across any mind-blowing theological insights along the way, be sure to let us know. Until next time, happy diving.